Welcome, this is a recorded session of the Post-Quantum Cryptography Conference of the PKI Consortium. This conference would not have been possible without our sponsors in Trust, HID Global, and PQ Shield, and the organizational support of the Post-Quantum Cryptography Working Group of the PKI Consortium, in particular in Trust, Logius, TNO, and CWI. And now we'll continue with our next uh, talk by uh, Andreas Hulsing, uh, and he's an associate professor leading the Applied and uh, Provable Security Group at Eindhoven University of Technology. His research focuses on post-quantum cryptography, cryptography that resists quantum computer-aided attacks, and Andreas' uh, works range from theoretical works, like how to model quantum attacks or formal security arguments in post-quantum security models, to applied works, like the analysis of side channel attacks and development of efficient hash-based signature schemes. In many of his works, Andreas tries to combine the theoretical and the applied perspective. This is especially reflected in his work on standardizing post-quantum cryptography. And he will give a talk on machine checking post-quantum cryptography. Floor is short. Hey. Slightly put this up. Okay. Um, I'm happy that for once I don't have to talk about hash-based signatures. This is kind of the curse haunting me. Um, I will talk about something that's much more fun, uh, as I think, right now, and that is um, how we actually make sure that all these new schemes that we're designing and building are actually secure. Whoop. This is really uh, at the heart of the, of the talk. How do we ensure that a cryptographic scheme is hard to break. And traditionally, um, you might know Bletchley uh, <coughs> Park, the traditional answer was cryptanalysis. So you have a bunch of really smart people, like smarter than me, start hammering on this and trying to break the scheme. And uh, if they just try long enough, indeed, you all these smart people tried, they didn't manage, then the scheme should be secure, right? So this is kind of why we think RSA is secure. This is why we think elliptic curve cryptography is secure, because a lot of people tried and actually failed. There's no, no guarantee that this is actually not doable, just that enough people tried and failed. Now, there's one problem with this approach. This does simply not scale. If you, uh, I think I have the numbers here. If you look uh, just at the new post-quantum, competitions. Uh, we had 64 schemes in the NIST competition, and yes, there were a few that were breaking on the first day, uh, broken. So actually, I think Lawrence managed within the first four hours to shoot down the first candidate. But <clears throat> I mean, they don't always make it that easy for you. And then you actually, you know, if you have a, if you have a break, that's an affirmative answer and everything is fine. If you don't have a break, it doesn't mean it's unbreakable. Um, if you look at the signature on ramp, we've got 40 candidates. If you look at the Korean post quantum competition, which is also currently running, you've got 16 candidates. Um, we've got a competition in China. As far as I know, we've got a competition in Russia. I don't know who will go next, but um, <clears throat> this is quite a lot of schemes that people have to look at. And if you really have to, to start checking each of them, then you might notice that there's not that much time that actually is spent on each of these single schemes, All right? So <clears throat> this really leaves the question, who's supposed to crypt analyze all of these? And I mean, this is just basic cryptographic schemes just for post-quantum cryptography. Um, this is not yet protocols because I mean, we're not interested actually in encrypting data. We are interested in securely communicating. We're interested in uh, securely storing data. Um, encryption is just the means to this, and you have to look at the bigger scheme, because if you can break that, even without breaking the encryption scheme, you didn't win anything, All right? And so <clears throat> the idea of proofs in cryptography is to actually make the job a bit easier. And so Instead of actually trying to break every single scheme, what you do is you build your scheme on a hard problem, and then you give a proof which says, as long as you cannot solve this problem, you cannot break my scheme. 
right? And so if I'm doing this for several schemes, as long as I'm relating to the same hard problem, crypt analysts just have to look at this one problem. And so, I mean, traditionally we had a few problems. We had the RSA problem, we had this free lock, we've got some um, bilinear map problems, but uh, in general, we had a really small number, and even with the post quantum cryptographic constructions, it is somewhat a manageable amount. While we've got a lot of schemes, we only still got a few problems that we have to manage. And even if you go to protocols, <coughs> you can then actually link your protocol via a proof to the hardness of these schemes, which in turn is linked to the hardness, usually not of one problem, but maybe two or three. But so you see, you keep it somewhat manageable. You don't have to, uh, to crypt analyze every protocol or every building block, but just these hard problems. Now, this is a beautiful idea, and uh, we built on this for a long time. But the problem is, of course, uh, writing proofs is easy, checking proofs is incredibly annoying and hard. Um, if you look at how people argue that the proofs are valid and it's the first thing like, yeah, I've published this in a huge venue. And if you look at uh, our big conferences, it's in the ICR, the International Association for Cryptologic Research, so our international organization, the top tier conferences are now, I think, at, at 400 plus uh, submissions that have to be reviewed. So if you're a board member there, you end up with 16 plus papers. Each of them has about 30 pages main body, which you're expected to read. And then speaking for my own papers, you end with something like 50 plus pages. I don't, you want to include everything. So this gives a nice paper. And uh, I mean, hardly anyone is reading this, right? So we moved a bit. By now, the, the proofs are not just pushed to the appendix, which is already a good start, but uh, it's still often hard to verify what's actually written in there within any reasonable amount of time, especially if you have two months to review 16 papers, maybe even with help, but you also got a day-to-day -day job, so this is not really working. Um, the next answer you can give is like, yeah, reviewers just make a sanity check, and then later on the community will actually check and will tell you that these proofs are actually valid, right? But if you look at ePrint, just this year, we already got like 1,700 papers on there. 512 of them are tech protocols, 264 tech public key cryptography. Uh, this is ignoring foundations and applications and several papers which don't have a tech. Um, <clears throat> and we've got something like close to 3,000 ICR members by now. All right, so 3,000 people have per year. I mean, the year is by far not done. To review something in the order of, I guess, uh, 2,000 papers, I mean, this, this will also not fly. If you think about cryptanalysis, you will not uh, really dive deep into a paper um, in a week or two or so. <clears throat> so, does this work? Of course not. Um, I'm just speaking about my own stuff uh, or stuff that I was uh, involved in finding and this ended up to be essentially all of the of the NIST candidates well one thing I actually stole from Peter but uh, <clears throat> so foremost the stuff where I made mistakes um, if you look at XMSS and Sphinx Plus um, we had a case where the proof was simply wrong um, if someone's interested I'm happy to explain what the issue in the proof was but it was with the kind of dependencies between values that only later actually occurred and if you know that they are there, then it's kind of obvious to see them. But if you don't notice, like many people read this proof and, and didn't see it. And then uh, <coughs> Mike uh, and others um, found this. Um, in the Elysium, we recently found a mistake. And actually, uh, this was found by two pretty large teams uh, at about the same time. But that actually dates back to a paper from 2012, which was cited over and over and used several times. So it's in this Fiat Shamir with the boards principle, which is uh, like the fundamental design principle of Dilithium and also of several other schemes. So this is uh, for the lettuce people, this is like the Lubashevsky signature schemes. Um, 
So both these things can be fixed, and they are fixed. There are new proofs given. So uh, Serge and uh, Fishwan and uh, Yale gave a QRAM proof even. So, so these proofs are recovered. But they actually require that you have to reanalyze your parameters. And you know, there were mistakes which were hidden for a long time. And we're lucky that they actually were not really bad ones. Um, but yes, more that can go wrong. So <clears throat> you can also have cases where the proofs simply don't apply. For XMSS and Sphinx, uh, we had in 2018, when uh, briefly after the, the first submission deadline of NIST, uh, Chris Pikert figured out that actually the tight security proof for Sphinx doesn't apply to general, like to Sphinx with, with regular hash functions, with standard hash functions, because the problem was we required that they are regular, which they are usually not. So they are not uh, n to uh, n to one, but they are actually uh, unbalanced, kind of. Um, and in 2022, uh, Antonov also found that the uh, SHA-256 instantiation of Sphinx actually has a significantly lower security level than conjectured by the security proof because actually the instantiation using SHA-256 does not achieve the security properties up to the level that we assumed. So in this case, really just the proof does not, does not directly apply. The proof was not flawed, but uh, the assumption was wrong. And similarly, in Kyber, um, <clears throat> on the one hand, we finally fixed this. Uh, the FO transform was actually not covered by a proof because Kyber did something a bit different, <laughs> like uh, uh, <clears throat> from the start, which they now changed. And also in the in the first round, they actually introduced key comp uh, compression, which they then later noticed, like ah, this is great, but it actually doesn't allow for security. Right, so all our final schemes, I mean, Falcon doesn't have a security proof, so they are, they are out of the game, but uh, all the other schemes actually had a bug at one point or the other in the proof. And again, all these are fixed now, so this is not a, a problem for the schemes, but it shows you that actually getting these proofs right is uh, pretty complicated. And there's a bunch of things that can go wrong. So I stole this from Peter from his invited talk at, um, at Pico Crypto. But as I said, we can have the proofs being wrong. Then you can still have the theorems being correct. This is quite often the case. So then you can actually recover the proof. In some cases, also, the theorem is wrong. Um, that does still not mean that you can actually break the scheme. But it can. The second category is that, the, that your proof simply doesn't apply to the scheme. For example, because uh, <clears throat> the proof is correct, but the theorem is actually insufficient, or the assumptions made in the, in the theorem actually don't apply. Um, then you can have cases where the proofs or the theorems are just too vague, so no one can actually verify if this is actually anything relevant or not. And uh, yeah, the most fun thing is uh, you can actually prove a lot of stuff which just is totally irrelevant. Like you can always prove that A is secure if A is secure. But you can actually obfuscate this in a way that is really hard to catch this. Um, so how do we solve this? I mean, I gave the answer in the title. Um, <coughs> I'm part of the Formosa Crypto Project. This is one effort out of many to actually formally verify cryptography. Our goal is, or one of the main goals currently, is uh, to give a verified post-quantum crypto library which is ready for deployment. Um, we have three main projects, which are two tools. So EasyCrypt is a, is a proof assistant, Jasmine is a programming language with a verified compiler. And then we have libjade as the actual crypto library, which is currently in development. We are about 30 to 40 people, which are really in the core community and active. And uh, we're linked via discussion forum where we have more than 180 people involved. So this is uh, slowly getting traction. Um, and so <clears throat> what can you do with these tools? Um, it, it roughly breaks into two parts. So on the one hand, you've got the adjustment part in which you can actually implement your scheme. And uh, from the adjustment code, you on the one hand get assembly code for your certified uh, compilation with certain additional guarantees, which I will not talk about today. 
And in addition, you can extract an easy trip model, which you can think about as a specification of the code that you wrote in a formal language. And then you can actually link this, no, you can link this uh, model via an equivalence proof to an abstract specification, which you might think of more the abstract, like the specification you would write in standard. And for that one, you can actually give a security proof in EasyCrypt, which is verified by the tool. Right, so if you, <clears throat> if you look at these, uh, we've got results on, on most of these blocks. So for example, uh, we've got a bunch of results showing, for example, the security of Saber, the security of the lithium, or also the security of XMSS and the, the core part of Sphinx where we analyze this part. So we've got an abstract specification and we have a proof of security for that. Um, and this is something you can actually even do in the, in the simple post-quantum setting, let's say. Um, and this already kills two of the, of the error cases, right? So proof is wrong, it's pretty hard to achieve. And uh, a too vague proof is also more or less impossible in this case. Um, the next thing is uh, linking the specification to the specification you get from the code. So in this case, this was so far only done for Kyber. So we're working on more, but uh, Kyber is the only project where we really got a full stack uh, proof now, which is not entirely public yet, but it's done. Um, so this allows you to exclude the case that the proof doesn't apply. Because in this case, well, the assumptions still have to be reasonable, but you definitely have a proof for the correct scheme. If your assumptions are reasonable, it's a different story. Um, and so the only thing that you still have to check in the end is that you're not proofing nonsense. And this can actually be aided, for example, we're currently developing standard libraries for security properties so that you don't make up nonsense security properties for your schemes because there's also a lot that you can hide in there. But um, that way we're trying to make this part as easy as possible for the, for the manual verification. <clears throat> and you can actually do a lot more, especially on the, on the implementation side, so on the adjustment part. Um, if you're interested more in that part, there is a great talk by Peter Schwabe um, at Chess this year, which you can find on YouTube, that talks about additional guarantees, like you can get certain constant time or side channel attack resistance properties. Uh, you can get security against speculative execution attacks, at least against the, the first Spectre versions, I think. Um, you get certain guarantees of memory safety, so the tool can give you quite a bit. Um, and of course, I'm just talking about the tool chain that I'm used to, but there's a bunch of other tools. There is a great paper which was first put on ePrint in 2019, but um, I think it's still pretty much up to date, which gives an overview of all the tools you have to actually machine check cryptography and uh, and also cryptographic implementations. So, of course, <clears throat> if everything is so great, why didn't NIST just ask for formally verified submissions entirely? Um, I think Peter had on a slide at some point because then they wouldn't be in, uh, in the next five years or so. Um, the problem is if you look at the example of Kyber. So Kyber is the only scheme where we've got really the full stack from a security proof down to an implementation, everything linked and, and nicely done, which is still not, not fully published because we still have to write the last paper or other people have to write the last paper. Um, this took more than three years of a lot of people that were involved. And especially there were also people that actually develop the tools involved. And this is something that actually still happens every now and then. So in many cases for new proofs, you actually need the tool developers to be involved because you still have to adapt the abilities of the tool to deal with certain things. So really annoying things uh, to prove currently, for example, are um, equivalence between two different ways of sampling random functions. Like that 
is often something you can on pen uh, with pen and paper you would just say okay point wise on every point I've got the uniform distribution in both cases everything is great um, telling this to EasyCrypt is hell this is uh, we spent like two weeks I think at some point uh, writing one proof um, and then if you go to the tool developers they can do this in one day uh, on like a tenth of the space but um, well you're not the tool developer so these are still somewhat expert tools um, you have essentially no automation especially for the easy crypt part so this is something that we want to do more on but uh, currently we simply don't have so um, you have to prove a lot of invariants and loops and so on and you have to repeat these over and over although you would often think that you could automatically derive these possibly um, and there's also little integration with the higher level tools so for example you have different tools with which you would analyze protocols but so far they are not linked yet um, so there's also quite some stuff to do still so in summary um, well actually uh, writing proofs on paper is hard but it's the best way for us to actually get somewhat a scalable security assessment of cryptography um, we have the tools to actually make sure that our proofs are correct but it's still hard work and actually a lot of research involved in writing these uh, mechanizations of, uh, of proofs in the tools the usability of these tools uh, still needs a lot of improvement um, if you're interested in these essentially for every use case there is a tool so uh, have a look at this uh, systematization of knowledge paper and uh, we hope to soon have out uh, the fully uh, verified uh, post quantum crypto library I think there are first versions for Kyber are actually out there um, and if you're interested you can always join the Formosa project so we're not a formal project uh, you can just uh, join the Sulip and uh, have a look at our website to see Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and we already have one question uh, from the online audience. Um, and basically in the idea of uh, we have auditors checking our proofs, uh, but who checks the auditors? Uh, so how do you know that the tools have no flaws here? Um, I would love to say the tools are entirely formally verified, but that's not true. Um, they are not foundational which means you have to trust the code base of the tools um, indeed soundness of these tools is always something uh, that is interesting to check and you can usually also find bugs in these tools it's more that usually you have to come up with very contrived examples to actually hit these bugs but you're never fully fully secure at that point if you don't fully very uh, formally verify these tools and people tried this but then the tools are even more unusable so there's currently the trade-off between uh, so you, so you had a slide taken from from peter like on the failure modes for the, the paper proofs did you also try to create this like what are the, the potential pitfalls for uh, the verified uh, well, so, so this one is left and the other one is of course there might be a bug in the tool yes yeah, yeah but also they like the verifying the theorem the proof correct uh, like you said this, these are expert tools so you need a lot of expertise and these proofs can also be complex uh, but you don't have to verify the proofs this is the nice thing you just have to verify the theorem statements oh yeah yeah Okay. which gets interesting because uh, what you often forget is that um, the theorem statements for example if you think about I don't know CCA security then your abstract definition of the encryption scheme is part of this um, your abstract definition of the adversary and its abilities is part of this so this whole game that you're usually using to prove it as these become part of the standard library they can be verified once and then uh, hopefully be accepted the pen and paper definition okay thank you is there a question from the audience can you please go to the mic and uh, ask a question there yeah i have an idea of how 
Koch or Lean Proof Assistant works, the interactive way, the tactics, the way you are automated. Can you give us maybe an idea of how you interact with those tools? Is it similar or is it very different? It is pretty much the same as Koch. Okay. So in the end, you have a proof, so you can step through interactively. And as soon as it's done, you can you can keep it and you can evaluate it over and over again. So you don't have to always do this interactively. Like uh, you're essentially writing code which you can directly interpret and see what your next proof code is. And, and you have tactics and automated. Uh, so you've yeah. got very simple automation. Like you've got some tech, some higher level tactics which try to brute force the goal. For example, they, they try to brute force an adversary call. If there's no real invariant needed or so, then they can actually automate this and close the goal. But in most cases, this will not work. And this is also Lambda Calculus uh, kind of foundation? No, or? it's a probabilistic, whole lot, a probabilistic relational whole logic. So yeah, essentially, you're, you're, um, you're trying to relate the behavior of two programs on input states with a certain relation and then you you predict their output relation thanks you're welcome okay. so um do you somehow model leakage and uh, is that possible or why isn't it possible there are tools which can really model leakage um there are first of attempts to at least look at um, certain abstract forms of leakage. But you essentially have to define your model yes, exactly. yourself. So there's currently no built-in uh, leakage model and, and very famous. But I mean, in theory, leakage resistance is just a different crypto game which you can define and different capabilities. then you can prove it as any other game. Um, yeah, so that is possible. I think one of your slides said that uh, Jasmine code is compiled to assembly, yeah. which should be for a specific platform. Um, because going through the GitHub, I think it's currently targeting Intel, like yeah. AMD64. Yes, um, I think they are working on extending this to other platforms, but I'm not sure what the status is about this. Right, uh, slightly related question, is there anything uh, uh, some sort of fundamental limitation of how all of this works, which would prevent uh, just converting Jasmine code to, say, C code instead of. Well, I mean, in C code, you lose essentially all your guarantees, right? Because okay. the compiler can do all kind of funny stuff. So right, all these right, right. Uh, guarantees that I mentioned with uh, um, uh, speculative execution attacks and constant timeness, and so this all, all goes them. memory safety, all goes out the window. There's right, no perfect. way. Thank you. Okay. Uh, then maybe I also have a, have a question. So we say now for Kyber it's full stack, uh, and the lithium is the other primary uh, standard. So how far the work is there? How much is missing? So, um, I so what we have published is a security proof for the lithium, for an abstract model which is already somewhat specific. So it already model, uh, models the mathematical structure behind it and so on. Um, I am not sure what the current status is of the implementation in Jasmine. And so there's, as the, the implementation, as far as I know, is not done yet, there's nothing to be linked yet. So, so still a lot of work uh, yes. to be done uh, there. And how modular is it, right? So we did all this effort now for, for, for Kyber, but how easily can you reuse things for other lattice based uh, camps? So actually, the, the Kyber proof. Um, we were just quicker in publishing, like in, in finishing the paper, and uh, but the, the Saber proof and the Kyber proof are on a high level using the same modular parts. So you can get quite modular. That's one of the strengths of EasyCrypt. Um, this makes your life a bit harder in the proof, <laughs> but. Uh, 
you can essentially go down. So for the XMSS proof, for example, we've got like every layer, we've got a one time six, uh, like a hash function, we've got a one time signature scheme, and um, I think we've got hash chains in between. Then you go to uh, a multi key instance of a one time signature scheme, then uh, you have the tree on top. So these are all modular parts that you actually include and can reuse, for example, in the Sphinx proof. Okay, thank you. Then, uh, if there are no other questions, uh, let's uh, thank uh, Andrea. In today's complex, fast paced world, you need a partner who can help secure your digital transformation so you can drive your business forward confidently. Someone who can fine tune and integrate the secure technologies that enable mobile identities, digital payments, and a hybrid workforce. You need a partner who will have your back so you can stay focused on the road ahead and accelerate your organization's growth. Entrust, securing a world in motion.